So we're going to talk a little bit about um, personal data. So does any of you track? Does anyone have a wearable? Does anyone use a wearable? Yeah? Cool, quite a few of you. So we're going to talk about, so if you need the slides and you can't see it, I've put all the slides on GitHub. So it's called Python for Self-Trackers. So if you need the slides or you want to look at the slides, the presentation's normally a bit longer, so I'm going to skip a few slides as we, as we talk. Um, so a couple of years ago, I got obsessed by a question. Um, and my question was, was can personal data, can self-tracking, can it enable, improve, and um, empower self-improvement? So this is a question that's gotten me deep into what we call quantified self and self-tracking. Um, and my personal belief is this is yes, and hopefully in the presentation I can show you some ways that you can use personal data for self-improvement. Um, so a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Mark. I'm a tech entrepreneur. I work in mobile and in web and dev. And of course, I'm a self-tracker. Um, and so what I want to focus on is this aspect of tracking. So for me, I've tracked thousands of things. And my, I, my computer is probably filled with all these little programs. And I've collected over, I would guess I have about five gigabytes of personal data that I've collected on myself. And I don't think every one of you should go out and collect and track everything. But hopefully sort of my experiments and my building different things in the data space, I can share with you how you can use personal data and self-tracking for maybe improving your health or changing how you do your work or your productivity. Um, so if you're interested after, I, I've been writing about self-tracking and quantified self on my, my blog. So I want to start by a personal example. So it's not a very great picture, but about two or three years ago, I was working at an uh, investment company in the States. And I was, you know, it was a great job, super excited, um, but I just kind of got fat. And not just that I got fat, I got kind of lost my energy. Um, and so one of the things I started to do was I wanted to not just improve sort of how I looked, but I wanted to improve how I felt, how I worked. Um, and one of the ways I was trying to understand this was by using my personal data. So I used data as a feedback, right? So when you have a business, right, you track maybe the metrics of your business. And I think we can do the same thing with personal health. So I don't think I've not so fat anymore. Um, but sort of using personal data, I was able to lose weight, sleep better, become more productive, and maybe happier. Um, so this is sort of one example. So as I said, the main question we're looking at today is can self-tracking and personal data help us better understand ourselves? So we, we now have opportunities with, with wearables and phones to collect all kinds of data. But sort of the question is, can that data help us understand? And in turn, can it help us become more productive, healthier, and happier? So what we're going to talk about, oops, what we're going to talk about is the first part we're going to talk about quantified self and self-tracking. You know, how can we measure life? What can we do to sort of start tracking? And what is all this stuff about tracking and personal data? And the second part, we're going to look at the idea of using Python and some open source code to aggregate and do some sort of basic data analysis. Who's a data scientist or who does data science stuff? Okay, not so many. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the cool stuff you can use Python for, for collecting your data and doing some visualization. And then if we have time, I'll talk a little bit how to build a, a personal data dashboard. And then I'll conclude by talking about some tips and advice if you want to start collecting, tracking, and using personal data to become what I call a data-driven you. Um, the idea that we can use data for feedback and for understanding. So how do measure a life, right? This question, I don't know if you know Socrates and Plato, right? This very old expression that, that he said, the unexamined life is not worth living. So for Socrates and this whole tradition of philosophers, and they were looking at a ways to understand themselves, right? So the idea is that they would ask questions or have dialogues to understand themselves. And so in some ways, the idea of self-tracking and self-understanding, it's a very old idea, right? I'm sure we all sort of spend time thinking about, well, who am I? You know, what can I do to improve myself or change myself? Um, but what changed in the last maybe 10 years is this, this idea called the quantified self. 
Um, so the word quantified means what? It's to get a number. And the self means about our self. Um, and this movement or this idea started in about 2007 from some guys at Wired magazine. Um, and what they were interested in was working on something that was not social media. So at the time, it was extremely popular, you know, Facebook and Twitter and all of this stuff. These guys were interested in understanding our relationship with technology. Um, and they tried to explore this by using technology as a way to reflect on their lives. Um, and so they came up with this new word. They created the word quantified self. So my definition, or a simple definition, is a quantified self, or self-tracking, is measuring or documenting something about yourself to gain meaning or make improvements. Um, so we're going to look at some examples. So one project that I, that I help on is, is this project called the Awesome Quantified Self. So after the talk, if you're thinking, ah, oh, what can I do to get started? This is a great resource that I've been contributing for. Um, so there's a lot of ways to track your life. Um, probably the most, can anybody guess the most popular way to track yourself? Everyone talks about what? Steps. You know, step trackers and, and probably the Fitbit. So that's one very popular way. That probably remains the most popular way, is ways to track your fitness. Um, there are ways to sort of aggregate your data. Um, there are ways to collect diet and goals. But probably the most common way to track yourself, or the way you are being tracked, is the fact that we all carry small computers in our pockets, right? We all have a smartphone. We all have an iPhone or an Android or, or some other phone. And so these devices, they have all of these sensors that collect all this data, and these different apps allow us to access this data. So a little bit about what I've been doing over the last years in the last couple of years is I decided I wanted to, quote, track everything. Um, and it was kind of a joke at the time. I was like, oh, it's impossible to track everything. But I said, one by one, I will track all kinds of different things. And so what did I, what did I track? Well, I track my time. So I use a program on my computer to track every single thing I do on my computer. And I use this as a way to understand how productive my time is. I track my tasks. So I can know how many things I'm getting done in a day. And I track, because I'm a writer, I, I write, you know, I track how I write, when I write, and sort of the energy around I write, my, my words. Um, and so this kind of falls into what I call time and productivity tracking. So one of my favorite tools for, for this is a tool called Rescue Time. The idea is that by tracking your time, you're able to understand how much time you spend on YouTube or Facebook, and you have a choice, right? Should I spend all my time during the day working on my important stuff, or should I end up getting it sucked into distractions? Um, and I, a couple of years ago, I started, you can't really see it, but um, I started wearing a wearable. So I started by having a Fitbit, and now I wear an Apple Watch. And this provides a, a whole host of, of data points around, around our bodies. Um, and I think in the future, we will see this data become an important source of, of, of health and, and wellness. Um, so some of the things I track is with my watch, I track my steps, my sleep, my weight. Um, but one of the most important things for anybody sort of thinking about their health is blood biomarkers. Um, so I don't have time to talk about all the details, but the idea is that your blood, by sort of being the conduit, the communication way that your body does things, it, it reveals signs that if you're healthy or not. So one of the things that I found by tracking my blood every three months for about a year and a half, I was able to make small changes to, all right, this hormone or this nutrient. And I was able to change that by using some supplements, by getting exercise, and I started to sleep better. I started to work better. Um, so that's one of the things in health, is checking your, your blood. So last year, I did 4,270,544 steps. And you can't really see it, but one day I did 50,000 steps. Any guesses why one day I did 50,000 steps? Shopping. Shopping? Shopping, yeah. I wish. I got no wife. If I had a wife, I'd be like super strong, too. Why, why did I do 50,000 steps? Any guesses? 
Yeah, I ran a marathon. So one of the things in this journey about like learning about personal data is that I wanted some personal challenges. Um, and it's really interesting to see the data points. So I ran two marathons last year. I ran a marathon in Chiang Mai uh, at 3 a.m. So that was the, the, the day. So there's a lot of ways to track your fitness. Um, like I said, you could track your heart rate. And you can also track something called heart rate variability. Um, so one of the most common ways we think about our heart, our heart rate, right, is the, the beats, right? The average beats per second or beats per minute. But there's a very interesting idea by tracking the changes in your heart rate. And this is called heart rate variability. And so heart rate variability allows you to track your stress. Um, so last night, if you went out and drank lots and lots and lots, and you're like, ah. Oh, the next day, your body will show this stress. And you'll be able to see it in by checking your heart rate variability. Um, and actually, there's a lot of things that contribute to stress. It could be work, it could be family, it could be working out, it could be travel. And so one of the interesting things, we can talk about this if we have time at the end, is how you can use understanding of your stress to then sort of make changes to get less stress or get what I would call positive stress. Um, so the other thing that I believe that we have an opportunity now is we can build a second brain, an augmented memory. Um, and so one of the things that I really have been working on is sort of different ways to collect the books I read, the articles, the TVs, the movies, the music. All of this allows me to sort of look back in time and find stuff about the past. So I don't know if any of you remember Harry Potter. Harry Potter had this, this thing he would look in and he could pull out the memories. So in some ways, if you track or you use certain tools, you can look back in time and find connections. So if you're, you're, you're creative or you're working on code or you're, you're writing something, you can use all of these sources to pull out, pull out your memories or build a second brain. So one of the things I tracked is podcast listening. Um, I was kind of surprised. I didn't think I was that into podcasts. But I listened to 298 hours of podcasts last year. Um, and some of the other things I track is my money, my photos, my location. Um, so one question you might ask is, well, why do people track, right? It's like kind of crazy. Uh, um, but there was some interesting research that found that there's primarily five big reasons why people track. Um, one is they find it entertaining. They call it self-entertainment. One is they find self-association. So the idea is people are part of groups, right? So you might have a meetup group where people are sharing their self-tracking. The other, probably one of the most um, significant reasons was self-design. The idea being that you can use tracking and data to sort of modify and change how you live, right? For health or productivity or happiness or, or better sex, if that was your thing. Um, the other one is self-discipline. The idea is by using tracking, right? If you're trying to lose weight, you can look at the scale as a way to sort of help you. Or if you're trying to get more exercise, you can use your tracking to sort of show that you're doing the work. But actually, interestingly, I didn't think about this because I'm young and I'm relatively healthy. Most important or the most popular reason that motivates people for self-tracking is self-healing. Um, because there's so much going on with your doctor and your medical stuff, many people, they're looking for empowerment and for understanding. So that's probably the most, in, most popular. Um, so there's a couple of benefits. I think we just talked about it. So the benefits of self-tracking, improved health, health, better time management, augment or improve your memory, maybe save or better invest your money, achieve your goals. So for me, one of the things I find in self-tracking that helps me is I'm able to document how I'm able to finish projects or work on goals or run a marathon. Um, but also I think it's really interesting with personal data is we can use it. It's kind of the thing that will be in the future, but we're able to work on now. Um, and for me, one of the reasons I self-track is a way to understand my use of technology. You know, we all have phones, we all have computers, we all have YouTube, but by tracking things, I start to understand how I spend my time on these services, and then how I want to spend time. OK, we're doing good. So there's a couple of opportunities I see. So I work in the startup space, and I work in the technology space. Um, and one of the areas that I'm focused on is opportunities in the tracking and personal data space. So I see sort of two major areas for building um, and working. Ooh, you really can't see this at all. So one opportunity is around enabling and tracking new data points. So we see scientists, we see engineers working on new sensors or new apps or new software that allow us to track new things. 
Um, so the idea is that we can create different data, we can collect different data. But I think the second opportunity, and what we'll talk about today mostly, is the idea is that we have all this data, but how can we get meaning or insight? How can we use this data to sort of start to understand? So this is the second idea, is that we can get more data, more data accessibility, and we can start to use machine learning, AI, all of these things to sort of parse and start to forecast with our data. Um, it's still very early, but the idea is that I think we saw a lot of talks over this weekend around, around machine learning. And what we can start to do is we can use that machine learning in, in our personal, personal wellness and personal health. Um, so over the last couple of years, I've been building a couple of tools to sort of, to sort of kind of work on these two areas for new data points and for working with the data. Um, so one thing I built, so I, I built a tool for looking at my photos. Um, so the idea is that on our phones, we're basically taking photos over and over and over and over. And there's all this opportunity around the data from those photos. And so what I built was a simple weekend project, of course, a weekend project that took weeks and weeks and weeks. Um, still not finished, it's a weekend. Um, but what I started with the simple idea was that what is the metadata in my photos and what can I learn from the metadata? And then I started on the next stage, I said, well, can I, can I add a bit of like machine learning or computer vision to understand what's in my photos? And so this is a project I've been working on to sort of explore personal data in my photos and then, and then sort of tell a story um, with my photos. Um, so it's called Photostats. If you need to, if you need to download a new app today, uh, <laughs> this is the one to download. Um, the other thing that I've built is I built a social network for people tracking their podcast listening. Um, does anyone listen to podcasts? Ah, pretty cool. So this is a, a, a small social community of people that track their podcasts and then they can see uh, some trends. Um, and one of the bigger projects that I've been working on that's, that's still pretty early is this project called Biomarker Tracker. Um, so as I said at the beginning, when you're thinking about health, I'm not convinced that steps is the most important data point. I'm also not convinced that DNA, it's not the whole story. I mean, DNA is an interesting piece about yourself, but if you're looking at your day-to-day -day or your week-to-week -week or month-to-month -month, um, health, the best way to understand yourself is to get a blood test. Um, unfortunately, when you get your blood test, it's very confusing, right? There's all these numbers, there's all these, all these stats, and you're like, what the hell? Um, so what I've built over the last couple of months is I have built what's the biggest open source database on biomarkers. Um, and then I'm working with some researchers, and we're building an app to sort of help you understand your, your blood chemistry. All right, so before we go into the second part, is there any questions about the first part about quantified self? We keep going? All right, let's keep going. So what I want to talk about now is I want to talk about Python, right? So we talked about self-tracking. There's literally, I think the, one of the researches I saw, there's 160,000 apps and services for self-tracking um, and for collecting data. So there's tons and tons and tons of services that allow you to track that allow you to get your personal data. You can get your data from your YouTube watching. You can get your step count. Um, but one of the problems I see is the data is in all of these different services. We could call it a data silo, right? You know, you tracked it with this thing or use this service, but all your data is trapped in that system. Um, the other problem is, is that we're just kind of collecting data. We're just collecting, but we're not doing what I call data engagement or data science. Um, so many of my friends that are not engineers and not technical, they like to track, but they never really do anything with it. They just track. So what, what's interesting about Python is the idea is we can use Python to collect the data and we can use it to sort of do some data science. So one of the open source projects, or I wouldn't even call it an open source project, I've given away a bunch of code um, in this repo called Quantified Self Ledger. Um, and so what I've been working on is these little scripts that allow you to collect data from about, I think we're, I don't know how many projects now. Let me look. I think it's about, let me look. Oh, no internet, forget about it. Didn't happen. So we've got about maybe six or seven services that, that integrate with this. It allows you to download your data 
And then this provides the first step to building a personal data dashboard. Um, so let's walk through this a little bit. Um, so this project has a couple of goals. The first goal is to download your data, to get your data. And so I want to talk a little bit how we can use Python to accomplish this. Um, so one of the reasons, there's a lot of languages we could do to build this. One of the great things about Python is it allows you to sort of manage the full, the full story, right? You can collect the data with Python. You can then do the data science with different sort of, we heard Wes talk about pandas. We can use pandas for the data analysis. And we can use things like Seaborn or Mat, Matplot for doing the, um, the data science and the visualization. Um, I think we'll skip this part. So there's some examples in the code if you want to look at how to download data from these different services. So some of the things we have is Fitbit, Rescue Time, this thing called Last.fm that allows you to track your music listening. Um, there's a couple of other sort of manual data stuff. Does anyone use a Kindle? Does anyone read on a Kindle? So Kindles collect all kinds of interesting data. So about maybe two weeks ago, I was like, I wonder what's in my Kindle. And so I went in and I wrote some code that pulls out all the highlights. And uh, I was able to explore. So I want to walk through that example. Um, so the problem with all of the data and all of these sources is, I mean, this is a classic data science problem, right? We call it data wrangling. Um, all of these different services provide all of this data in slightly different formats. So one of the big challenges in, in sort of my project and in sort of projects around data science and just data in general is we need to manipulate it so that we can start to use it. Um, and so there's a couple of interesting challenges. So the first challenge is, is we need to get a unified reference, right? If we're going to compare data from your steps and your time tracking and your health, we need to sort of get it to all be unified. One of the interesting things is, is we need to also work with time zones. It's one of the craziest things, right? Someone's tracking your stuff, but you're getting your data in London time. But your other service is tracking it in something else. So let's walk through a couple of quick examples. Um, can't really see this, but this is sort of the raw, the raw extract that you can get from, from your Kindle, from your book reading. And this is just one example. So we can get basic sort of information. And then we can use, ooh, you really can't see that. Um, anyways, but I'll talk through it briefly. So we can use pretty simple ba ba basic Python functions like the date time um, function. And what this allows us to do is we can look at the timestamps and we can say, all right, the timestamp's this. And we can, first of all, with pandas, pandas is great, by the way, if you've never done it. Let me highlight this. I think it's better if I highlight it all. So what we can do is we can take the timestamp, we can convert it to a date time, which is a sort of special format um, in pandas. And then what we can do is we can parse it into the things we need. So if you want to start to compare your time in terms of a year, a month, a day, a day of the week or the hour, is we apply some sort of very, very basic functions. Right? So we've converted it to a date time. We've then used some different functions to either extract the year or the month. Um, and so this code runs on basically every single data source. So by the end of running this on seven or eight different data sources, we have a unified um, time, time reference. What this then allows us to do is to do some other sort of basic, um, some basic functions, right? We can run this little count function, looking at the month, looking at the count of each month, and then we can create uh, a simple table, right? This is the month, this is how many, how many highlights. We can then write very basic, simple um, matplot code to, to plot this. You can look at the code after if you want. And this allowed me to find an interesting thing. I was like, what the hell? Why in 2017, in January, April, why did, I, why did I stop reading as much? Or why didn't I stop? Um, so these were certain insights I was able to find. Um, the second challenge around all of this data. So the first one we talked about was we needed to find a unifying timestamp, right? Because most of the data for self-tracking has a date and a time. The second problem is, is we don't necessarily want the raw data. And so this is the idea is when I was looking at my health data, this could be the same for Fitbit or, or, or other wearables, it's this raw data, right? I don't, you can't probably see it, but it'll say, you know, specific time and so many steps. That's not great for what we need. So what we can do is use this, this model called split, apply, combine. Um, 
So this is a fairly classic model in data science. Um, and the idea being is that we have a key value combination. And by first splitting it into its groups, so we take all the A's in this example and all the B's and all the C's, we then sum the, sum the results and then we get a unified table. This is kind of a way, anybody knows what pivot tables are. This is the sort of um, the Python or the pandas way of doing pivot tables. And so what we have to do with most of our self-tracking data or personal data is we need to split it into its, its groups run a function on it, like the sum or the average or something like that, and then we recombine it. Um, so the, the basic idea of split, apply, combine is the first step. You split the data into groups. It could be, in my case, we're mostly splitting it based on the date or the hour or the month. Um, there's some other stuff we could do is we could just, we could just split it into productive time or, or travel time or something. We then run a function like an aggregation or sum, and then we combine it into a new data frame. Um, so this is sort of one other example, is looking at my time tracking, this seems ridiculous, right? I tracked one second on, on, on Wikipedia looking at one page. And so obviously I'm not going to do data science and do some aggregation on one second. What I'm going to do is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run some functions to, first of all, the first step is like we said before, is I, I applied the code we looked at before to set the date time, right? To set the year, the month, and uh, the day. So first of all, that was the first step. Then, can't really see this, let me highlight it. We then use this great, like very useful function in, in pandas called group by. So what we did is I took all the data from the, the, the activities I was tracking on my computer, we grouped it by the date, we grouped it by the productivity type. So I, I track five different productivity types. I have very productive, Productive, neutral, distracting, very distracting. So I grouped it by that, and then we, we basically did a sum. We, we basically counted the, the number of seconds, and then we combined it. So we then combined it into a, a data frame in this step. So this is like a new data frame. Each row will be a different productivity for that date. And then we create a pivot table. You can try this code later if you want. So what we did is we take the data based on the date. We create a pivot table using the index is the date, and then we created a column for each of the, the different um, productivity types. And then we run this numpy function of sum. And the end result is, at the end of, of this, is each day has the amount of time I spent product productively distracted or you know, very productive on my computer. And so th this is sort of a process we have to unfortunately do with every single data, data source. Um, how are we doing, 15 minutes? Cool. So these are some examples. If you want to play around, one of the interesting things about this code is for me, a lot of the data science examples on the internet, they're cool, but they don't really apply to me, right? It's not my data, it's not my stuff. So one of the interesting things, and I've been learning more about data science and stuff, I find it very interesting to work with my own data. So you know, I'll track my, I'll track my phone usage for a month, and then I'll be like, all right, I'm going to learn some more pandas, or I'm going to learn some more matplot. Um, so all this code is on the internet if you want to start playing with your data. So I want to talk briefly about the idea of building a dashboard, a personal data dashboard. Um, and the motivation here is by doing the data science and sort of processing the data, we're trying to come up with a product or a solution that helps us um, make changes, make an understanding. So I said at the beginning, I'm trying to work with personal data to understand myself or understand humans, right? We often say physics is, is the hard science. But my, my opinion is actually social sciences. I'm a sociologist. I studied sociology. I find that that's the, really the hard problem, understanding humans. But by using personal data, we can start to tease out some of the motivation, some of the things we do. Um, and in trying to improve myself, I've been building a various kinds of personal data dashboards. Um, so this is a way to sort of say, all right, I'm trying to become, I'm going to prepare for a marathon. Can I look at my data to understand if I'm getting more prepared or I'm just getting more stressed and more tired? Um, but the big challenge here is about, about the same challenge we said before, is the data is a mess, right? We've got data in all of these different systems, but how do we get what I call like a convergence of data? How can we bring all of the data together? Um, so 
briefly to talk about like what we looked at before is first of all we needed to have the t common date time references so we just looked at that a few minutes ago we then need to take each of these data systems and we need to combine them into a unified data frame I mean you don't have to necessarily combine them to get the same results you could use them separately um, but I find this to be the easiest way so the goal is to look at processing and combining your data so, yeah so we just looked at this in the last part is we were able to to pull in this data and then save it to a CSV so that's generally the best way in pandas um, is to save your data so what we do is you know we take each of these data sources and we import it so in my case I imported about I don't know 10 10 data data sources and then the next step is to combine it well for, first step is to count it so in my case I have tracked 2,099 computer days, 760 days of steps. Um, I, lost, I lost some of that data. And then 621. So I have a bunch, a bunch of data. So as I said, I have gigs of data. So the first step is to import it and sort of get a general high level understanding. Um, the next step is to combine it. So th this is a little bit hard to see, but what we have here is we're using a simple, simple merge function, right? Um, in pandas, this is the sort of magic that happens. What's cool about pandas is you don't really have to know the details, but you can use some of these functions. So what we did here is we have a data frame, or a list actually, a data frame of all of the data sources. We then use a reduce function where we take the left side and the right side and we merge it. We merge it on this field called date. Um, so the previous steps we looked at was taking all of this data, we were processing it. In some cases, we had to convert the time zones to match. Um, and the end result is we have all of these, these data sources then combined into, I don't know, 30, 30 some, maybe about 37 columns. And so we have, you know, how many seconds I was running, how many songs, how many photos, you know, what place was I in, was I traveling, was I sick, was I drinking? All of this data, it's all in these separate, these separate data sources. And what I'm trying to work on and trying to explore is, can we take this data, combine it, and to tell a story, to use it to, to do something? Um, and so one of the first things I've done is most of my data goes into Google Sheets. Um, it's maybe not the best way to do data science and explore your stuff, but it's very practical for exploring. And so what I've been able to do is I've been able to explore the, a very important relationship for me is how much time I spend on my computer and how much time I spend on projects. So I find this to be, of all the changes I've made, was I decided that my computer was for work most of the time. Um, and so this, this, this one, you can't really see it very well, is this is the relationship between computer time and um, project time. And by getting those more and more closer, it, it shows for me how how I spend my time on my computer on work. That means I don't spend more time on my computer, I just spend my time on my computer doing you know, work or studies or things like that. Um, the second thing I've been using is I use a tool called Tableau. Does anyone use Tableau? You know, the, a little bit? Um, this is a, a business intelligence tool, a bit of a data science tool that makes it quite easy to explore your data, to build data dashboards. Um, so it's an American company that basically takes your data and it provides a kind of intuitive way to build charts and graphs. I think we all know in Python it's not that fun to build part like graphs. It's not that, you know, you gotta write all this code. Um, so this is a kind of interactive way to explore your data. Um, so I, I, I don't wanna go through all of this. I'll, I'll leave some time at the end. Um, so we've got a dashboard of sort of weekly and monthly trends. So for me, I'm trying to understand was last week good, was last month good, what worked, what didn't work. Um, the other thing I've been using, using Tableau for is to start to understand certain relationships. Um, so I'm able to see is there a relationship between steps and tasks? Is there a relationship between the songs I listen to and productive time? I actually found, I mean, I can't really show it in this example, but I started to listen to certain kinds of music, and certain kinds of music like put me into a very productive mood. Um, there's a whole science around this, around using you know brain waves to do this, and I, I was able to tease out some of the relationships in the data. Um, so, like I said, we can use these dashboards to explore your data, um, find correlations, and then sort of the the next, oops, 
we'll just we'll just skip these. Um, and what I think is sort of the next stage that we're all going to be eventually living and participating in is this machine learning around understanding our personal data as a as a kind of reflection. All right, so I got about five more minutes. So what I want to conclude with is this idea of tips and ways to become a data-driven you. Um, so the idea is today we have businesses that are data-driven, right? We have Facebook, we have Google. All of them are using data to optimize for their business metrics. What I believe is we need to work on building this optimization for being the best version of you. Um, and it really doesn't matter if that's you know, it doesn't necessarily mean you have to be the best, best version of everybody. You can find your own version that's right for you. And I think data is the way we can, we can make this happen. Um, so one question you might ask yourself is like, all right, Mark, you track all of this crazy stuff. It's impossible. I'm never going to track all of that stuff. I agree. You probably shouldn't waste your time on this. This was my adventure. But I think there's four areas that everyone should consider tracking. Um, so the four areas I think we should all consider tracking is our health, our time, our goals, projects, and tasks, and money. Um, so health, I don't necessarily think we need to track, you know, a billion metrics about your health. What you need to find is one or two data points that show you if your lifestyle, if your behavior is, is, is improving your health or staying healthy. The second one is time. I think we all know this, that time is even more important than money. Um, so if you spend your time well, you can improve on your projects. If you spend your time, you know, drinking in the bar or watching cat videos on YouTube, you're probably not doing what you want. Um, it doesn't mean you don't have entertainment. I mean, I think that's, that's not what I believe. But I think we can use, we can track our time to understand ourselves. Um, and then the last thing is, I think, goals, projects, and tasks. And so for me, I use tracking to help understand this. How to track these things, as I said, for health, I think the best way to track your health is blood tests. I think the second most important thing you can do to improve your health is sleep more. Um, I would guess probably 90, 95%, 99% of us probably don't get enough sleep. Um, and in the last year, I decided my goal this year was to sleep eight hours a day. Um, and interestingly, not only do I feel better, um, all of my numbers have improved too. So by sleeping more, it seems strange that my blood work is better. Um, I've actually been more productive. Um, as I said, to track your time, a great tool is rescue time for money. Thailand's a little bit complicated for tracking your money, but um, I track my tasks using a tool called Todoist. All right, cool. I want to end by talking about this idea of deep work. Has anyone heard this word, deep work? Deep work. Um, so one of the modern challenges we have today is chat, email project management tools. I'm sure you all see this. Right? I mean, some of you, I can see, oh, you're getting a buzz on your phone, on your watch, all these notifications. Um, so all of these notifications, these distractions, these emails, um, they take us away from doing deep work. Um, so the, the definition of deep work, is, there's a great book about it by this guy named Cal Newport. Um, the definition of deep work is professional activities performed in a state of distraction-free concentration that push your cognitive capacities to their limit. These efforts create new value, improve your skill, and are hard to replicate. So let me walk through this, this idea. Um, if you want to create the next greatest you know, piece of code, you want to write a great story, you want to, to do something great, these things are hard, right? You know, if you want to create a great piece of software or write a great story, you can't do this by every five minutes checking your email. Um, and so the challenge in deep work is that you need to put yourself in a state where you're not checking your email. Um, the idea being is checking your email takes you away from the concentration. Um, and if, if you're able to do deep work consistently, you can be the best anything, right? And I find this in myself and I find this in my friends. The people that spend their time on hard, focused work, they produce the best stuff. Right? Um, I like to say I don't want to be the world record holder for the fastest email response. Right? My goal is not to be number one response in line or WeChat or whatever. Um, so the challenge with deep work is, and the question I would ask you is, are you getting time every single day of at least one or two hours of no email, no checking your phone, and you're getting focused work? Um, and you can track this. I would even say if you can find three or four hours a day, this can change your life. 
So as I said at the beginning, can personal data enable self track can personal data enable self improvement? I think the short answer is yes, but there's some challenges. First of all, when it comes to self tracking and personal data, you need to engage with your data. So many people talk about I got a wearable, I'm still fat. I'm like, but it's not the wearable that makes you less fat or makes you healthier, right? You need to use the data from your, from your trackers and you need to start to think about lifestyle changes. So the first thing is, yeah, personal data, great. Self-tracking, great. But engage with your data. I mean, you all, you all are technical people. That means you can use things like Python. Um, you can use your data. You can think with it. And what I think is important is to leverage data to support your, your goals. So like I said, my opinion is it's easier than ever to track, right? Uh, I think I cited there's 160,000 apps in the App Store from running, from checking your weight, all of these things. So it's easier than ever to track. Um, I find there are some data points that are more important or more significant than others. Um, there are two tips, like I said. Track your time. Get a health checkup. Like, you'd be surprised. If you check your blood work, you might discover something that might be um, not what you wanted. Track your, track your work, right? One of the simplest things that I, I, I have, a, that I found that really helped me get better is I make a list every morning and I write one thing at the top of the list. What is the most important thing I can finish today? And then I write below, I said, what are the things I will not do today? So meaning I don't want to spend time on things that waste my time and I want to focus on one or two things a day. The idea being is if I can focus on that for two or three or four hours in deep work, I can make progress. Um, the second tip is engage with your data. If you start tracking, don't just track. Find a way to use it. Create, you know, create something in Pandas or create something in Tableau. Um, and as I said, I think Python is a great tool. It's a tool that lets you bring your data together, explore it, process it, visualize it, and in the future I hope to talk more about how we can use machine learning to forecast. Cool. Thank you. Any questions? So, uh, you use, I presume you use uh, Pandas for data ranking. And I'm not sure uh, if uh, you also use other tools and then eventually ended up with uh, Pandas. Like uh, maybe SQL is also capable of doing like uh, data aggregation as well as like, well, maybe I can even do the pivot function in SQL. And also in R, I believe uh, there's a package called uh, Deplyr. I'm not sure if I pronounce it correctly, D-P-L-Y-R. Mm -hmm. And uh, we can apply uh, SQL-like uh, to the data frame, and then maybe got the same outcome. Totally. So uh, this is PyCon. So we talked about Python. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I use, I use R as well. So I'm, I'm a big fan of R. I think there's some cool things in R. Um, as I said, I also use, I use Tableau, which is an interesting tool. I also use, I use Google Sheets, which is an interesting tool. I think you point to an interesting challenge, and what I'm working on is the problem of data storage, right? And so maybe this is the, the journey that I'm doing. Right now, most of the data, I use Pandas as a way to process it. Um, long term, I want to come up with, I guess, an online or a, a web version or an app version to sort of store your data. Um, and so that's one of the next challenges, right? So I've worked on collecting the data, I've worked on processing the data, and now we start to start working on um, storing it, yeah. Okay, the next question, I think you can choose not to answer it. But uh, you uh, mentioned you have uh, some idea to develop an app uh, to track your uh, blood test level. Yeah. And I think the challenge is that uh, in maybe at least in Thailand, most hospitals still keep the patient record in paper. Sure. So how do you source that? Yeah, so uh, this is one of the projects I've been working on called BioTracker. So this started from this, too many slides. So this started from the idea that I found blood tests to be hard to understand. So you go get a blood test and you have all of these results. So what we've built, or what we are building, um, is the idea that the first step on anything you track is you need to sort of understand it. So what we've got is this database that gives you the basic understanding about your blood tests. Um, and for, for the data entry part, 
you're completely right. Right now, it's a manual tool. You type in your, you type in your blood results. But it, it's not that hard. Um, in the future, we hope to work with some of the hospitals. It's a huge problem in Thailand. The hospitals are not really that cooperative. I guess, uh, and the labs and stuff. So, but I'm, I'm, I have some stuff. I mean, it's, it's a project for now to empower people. I think in the future, if we want to get more accessibility, we have to figure out these, these sort of things. We're seeing changes in the United States, though, in terms of hospitals that get our data. Yeah. So, uh, there are other sources of tracking these results, right? Yeah. Uh, there are uh, other sources of tracking this data. Uh, Which data? You, uh, uh, this kind of biomarkers. Yeah, there's uh, a couple of things. Um, are, are you working with them as well, or like I just find like you know the reason why hospitals do not want to engage is actually because of popular uh, news media articles about how it can be misused actually, mm. and there's a big problem with it because people want to forge ahead, but at the end of the day you need to think about like if your data is going to be used like this, what are the insurance companies going to think about you? You know, I mean, there's yep. all this like data ethics behind it. Actually. Sure. So I think uh, anything in the medical space is a it's a hard challenge. Um, for now, the reason I built this is I found it really hard to understand my own personal data. And so one of the things that I mean, I think my whole story is understanding, using personal data for self-empowerment. And so this is a, I actually don't, I don't care about insurance. I don't care about the ethics. I don't care about that. What I care about is helping us understand and improve ourselves. I mean, the reality is, is these, these challenges around, you know, governance and data, all of these, they, they're annoying. But for now, my main focus is helping, helping us understand ourselves. Um, so I think eventually I'll have to deal with that. But for now, I'm just going to be the open source hacker that just that builds cool shit. <laughs> yeah. I think like, that's great. But then what if they get a health problem and how they go with it? Yeah, that's a whole other. We can talk about that, that after. It's a fair question. Any other questions? Maybe continuing uh, to my last question. Mm. So, uh, if you plan to ship this, uh, your app worldwide, how do you uh, have you thought about like, a GDPR policy? Yeah, I mean, you put your data in this and you can get your data out. Yeah. I know. Uh, and how do you deal with that data privacy? Because that is a big issue, right? Sure. I mean, I think that we're all dealing with that. So one of the things that, so I gave this talk uh, two weeks ago, and it basically started by, we're all dealing with GDPR, right? All of the data privacy stuff. But I find that that conversation misses the other side of the conversation, which is what? Data empowerment. So now we're all talking about data privacy. Now what we've done is we've said, oh, don't touch my data. Oh, no, my data, my data. But the reality is most people, they don't know what the fuck's in their data. They have no idea. They had like, oh, don't, I'm, I'm going to lose my data. But they don't know. They don't care. So what I think is, at least partially, is that it's a balance. We need to pr protect privacy. But at the same time, we're missing this huge opportunity around empowerment with data, engagement with data. Um, the short answer is we just got to follow the rules. You know, GDPR is it's, it's a, it's a, it's a great framework for now following the rules to do a data-driven business. It's just a frame. I don't look at it as something that's going to disincentivize, you know, discourage me from doing data businesses. It just means that now, you as a consumer can tell me, you're like, okay, I want you to get rid of my data. No problem. Actually, so that you didn't see this in the, in the example, so I have this photo tracking app. This is probably the only photo tracking app that I don't ever touch your photos. <laughs> I can't touch your photos. So actually, I made a photo tracking app that only works on the device. So I guess internally, I believe you should be able to do the tracking without, without someone taking your photos. Um, there's all kinds of crazy stuff around what companies do with your photo data. You know, if you decide on, on Line or Instagram or any of these programs that let you look at the photos, they can know every single place you go. Every single place that, if you've taken a photo, and there's, there's GPS data, it can, it can map out all kinds of your behaviors. So for me, it's a little bit scary. I'm like, just because I put my, my photo on Twitter doesn't mean Twitter should be able to look at everywhere I've been in the last few days. Um, so what I'm, I guess my, my point being is I think privacy is an important thing, but it's probably half of the story. You know, it's you know, using your data, getting people to understand their data, stuff like that, yeah. Uh, okay, I think we about time for this session. Yeah. So uh, thank you, Mark, very much for this uh, wonderful uh, talk.